We're good. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. So again, thank you, Paul, for those stories. I think this panel is really a great segue from the last session because I think we heard some great takeaways and some great ideas from outside industries, outside companies about communicating values of their product. And this is a great segue to our panel talking about communicating the value of transit. And I'm really excited about the panelists that we have here today because I think we actually represent a cross-section of roles in agencies here in the Southeast. So let me go tell you a little bit about our panelists today. So I'll first start off with Belinda. Uh, Belinda Wadiel Brill is coming to us from Knoxville, Tennessee. Are you, are you the only one from Knoxville? Anyone else from CAT here today? I am. I'm the only one. OK. Anyone else from Tennessee? I know some Cardiff folks are here as well. Yep. OK. Some other, in, in Memphis as well, I in should Memphis say. Is so I'd love to tell you a little bit about Belinda. And again, she's kind of representing one of these three perspectives on this topic, which I'm really excited about. So Belinda started her career at Knoxville Area Transit in 1989. 98. 1998. 1998. So got that extra year of experience in there. As she started there as the marketing manager, so starting off from really this perspective of communicating the product of what Knoxville Area, area Transit uh, delivered. Uh, currently, she's the Director of Communications and Service Development, but really, Belinda does a little bit of everything. In addition to knowing people on the spot in our audience, Glenn, uh, she also handles a little bit of um, communications, customer service, outreach, and service planning. So she really does a lot of different roles um, at a small agency. Uh, Belinda received her master's degree from the University of Tennessee and her bachelor's degree from Rhodes College. So welcome, Belinda, Thank to our you. panel. Next, I'm excited to introduce Kelvin Miller. Kelvin comes to us from Montgomery, Alabama, but that is certainly not the only place that he's seen his tour of duty in transit. <laughs> so Kelvin Miller is the... <laughs> he started there back in the what, your early teens? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and, and I'm still 25. That's right. <laughs> so Kelvin's actually been the general manager over at the M since 2006. Yes. Correct? And, but since then, I guess, or before then, he started as an operator back in 1984. And, and you're telling my age. <laughs> <laughs> he was breaking the, driving, you know, the driver's license age when he was driving when he was six. But you were an operator in Blacksburg? Yes. OK, so Virginia Tech, he's a Hokie. Uh, started driving at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg. But since then, he has operated different properties all over the country, including Texas, Massachusetts, Virginia, and um, Georgia, and now Alabama. Um, Kelvin received his bachelor's degree in business management from, from Virginia Tech. And he's also the treasurer of the Alabama Transportation Association. So welcome, Kelvin. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, I have Leslie Casita, who is right here from Atlanta and works at the Atlanta Regional Commission. And Leslie has a really interesting role, and I'm really excited to bring her onto this panel. She is the principal program specialist of transport te transportation technology, where she does a combined role of being a web and mobile applications developer and a planner, so kind of a, a unique hybrid of, of roles in what she does there. Leslie's role, is unique in the, well, Leslie's role is unique in that way, but she maintains and develops web and mobile applications and works on policy to help prepare the region for transportation and technology enhancements in the future. Uh, Leslie joined the ARC in 2014 after working at a nonprofit advocacy center on transportation and community development. So please join me in welcoming our panel today. So this is going to be a little bit of a different format than before. None of the panelists have had a, they're not going to have a canned presentation, but this is going to be more of a coffee talk type of discussion where I'm going to ask them some different questions related to this topic. So maybe just to start off with one that um, I was thinking about um, early on. So on this topic of storytelling, we're talking about how to effectively communicate the value of transit to different audiences. And effectively, in your different respective communities, Knoxville, Montgomery, and Atlanta, you're trying to communicate the value of transit to widely different audiences, especially in your different roles uh, between working with the region as a general manager and, and kind of marketing and communications. So maybe just to start off, what are some methods that you guys have found have had to work across different audiences uh, that you speak with? And this is something maybe I'll have all of you guys chime in on. Linda, why don't you start? start? <laughs> Since you're next to me, why don't you go ahead and get Doom. it started? OK. Um, so yeah, communicating the value of transit. Um, well, I think that it's a big challenge, you know, because transit kind of faces an uphill battle, um, as we heard um, earlier today. Um, but one of the things that we do um, in Knoxville is, is to really, because there are so many different audiences, you know, when you work on a marketing plan, everybody, well, what's your target audience for this? Well, um, I think we really try to drill down and do specific marketing to very specific audiences. So 
um, and, and have a totally sort of different method and approach and message to those different audiences. So seniors, um, we approach with a lot of hand-holding. Um, you know, like, let's all take this fun route together and our outreach coordinator is going to go and walk through this with you. And next time, you're going to have the confidence to go um, by yourself or with this other, you know, group of seniors. So, um, you know, there's that. There's a whole different way to target millennials, which is all social media. We don't, granted, this is actually sort of changing. I was going to say we don't do a lot of seniors marketing on social media, but, I mean, my mom's on Facebook. So, um, I, you know, I think that's sort of starting to change. But, but um, there's, there's so many benefits to transit, and, and so there's so many different messages out there that we really try to do as, as target, kind of targeted sort of smaller campaigns as opposed to some overarching um, kind of community-wide campaign that costs a lot more money. Um, we also um, tend to partner with people who are more popular than we are. I recommend that highly, like a business district where it's all cool and hip and they've got a ton of social media followers. So um, it really goes a long way um, as far as really getting your message out there, letting somebody else, a really great partner, get your message out for you. Um, we use um, partners like breweries and coffee shops and stuff like that, too, to help get our message out. So that's um, a little perspective from Kat. Cool. Thank you. She took you all my answers. Oh, oh. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what, he, what she said. <laughs> yeah, what she said. One of the things that we try to do in Montgomery is... Uh, reach out to different agencies that use our service and those who potentially could use our service. Uh, recently we went through a route change where we met with human services agencies. We actually brought them to us. Uh, in hindsight, I think a lot of times we probably should have went out to them instead of having them come to us. Uh, one of the things that I do for those who use the services, I'm actually out at the transit centers every day talking to the riders. I go to uh, Leadership Montgomery, which is a leadership group in Montgomery. I speak to that group quite frequently about the, the benefits of public transit, about why we think folks should use public transit. In Montgomery, it, it's, it's tough getting folks to use public transit because everyone thinks that public transit is only for those who have to use a service, not for those who need or want to use a service. So we're trying to focus on the, what we call the choice riders, trying to get some of the choice riders to use the service. Most of you all know the history of, of buses in Montgomery and some of the challenges that we have with public transit in Montgomery. And the more we go out and talk to the folks in the community about the benefits of public transit, the more aspects that they can see that we have of public transit. A lot of times we actually have uh, little school kids who come and we go out to the schools talking about public transit. And you say, well, what do you do with those school kids who may or may not, they have school buses to ride? Well, what we emphasize is you may have a parent or a grandparent who actually have to get to somewhere, a doctor's appointment, or just to visit friends, and they don't have vehicles where they can drive. So we get to the school kids to tell them, hey, get your parents or your grandparents to try public transit and we can get you to some of the places that you need to go. Yeah, uh, I would echo everything just said. Uh, drilling down is, is key to the audience, meeting your audience where they're at, figuring out who you're trying to, to move along to transit. Um, at ARC, we have a couple programs we oversee and manage. One is our TDM program, Georgia Commute Options, and that in the past has been really heavily targeted to millennials. That's what consultants told us we should do. Um, we're in the process of revamping that marketing, so we'll see where we go next. Um, some lessons learned from the Mobility Lab presentation, some of the scare tactics and were proposed to us, so um, <laughs> there's some good, fun conversations that I think we're on the same page about. Um, so we'll see where we go with that. The, we have some, um, atltransit.org is one of the platforms I manage, and um, I'll admit, manage poorly. I just don't have enough time in the day to maintain <laughs> it. Um, but that serves to um, bring all of the, the regional transit operators onto one platform so someone can go to one page and check out all the routes, all the information you might want about bus service and whatnot. Um, that was a really collaborative effort to get all that information today. Uh, today, if you go to Google Maps, 
Um, it'll tell you about Greta and Marta routes, and hopefully we'll get GCT. Does it? Does it? Does it? Okay, GCT's on there. Um, Coblink, I think, is still not on there. Anyway, we have other operators that are not on the most ubiquitous platforms yet, so that's where ATL Transit came in. Um, we also partner with, with the cool kids, like Marta Army, <laughs> who will be speaking um, <laughs> later on, on occasion. Uh, it's, it's a matter of meeting the public where they're at. So we have a huge research arm at ARC that Audrey was a part of, um, making us successful. Um, and I have to update one of Ben Limmer's stats. We have newer data for him. But uh, we do push information so that, they, so that our partners can make their own stories, because the local stories is key. Um, they're on di across different programs. We'll create some good data, provide the insights, um, and not curate the narrative for them, but help them apply it to, to local, local needs. Um, I don't know if that goes to answering your question, but we can't be everywhere at, at all times. Um, I'm terrible at social media, so <laughs> I know um, I would need someone at the local level to do the Twittering and whatnot. Yeah. Great. One other, one other thing that I may add is that um, <clears throat> I think the best communicator for public transit is the the bus operators, the mechanics, the customer service folks who are actually the frontline folks of our service. I tell our folks all, every day, people aren't gonna use public transit or they're not gonna use the public transit because of me. They don't see me every day. You are the ones that they see, that they communicate, communicate with every day. So those are the ones that I think we have to start with first, are the frontline employees. Some really good points to start off with, so, so thanks for that. So maybe I'll, I'll maybe shift gears on, uh, ask a question to Belinda. So I know you've been in the marketing and communication side. It's not going to be a hard one, don't worry. I think. <laughs> but something, I think, I think failure is a very strong word. But I, I do think with this audience, it's actually good to hear maybe your perspective in the marketing and communications for so long. Maybe hearing some of the things that you would steer people away from or things that you've experienced that did not necessarily work as you intended and maybe sharing some of those lessons learned uh, with this audience. Yeah, I mean, I think we all have plenty of those stories. And I think, um, especially in marketing, and if you're a smaller system, your marketing budget is not huge. And so, OK, there you go. <laughs> Mine's a little more than that. So, um, But a lot of times what we do um, is we'll put out a campaign, but we don't necessarily budget the dollars to follow up. How did, how did the campaign go? Um, how do we know how the campaign went? Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not um, really great at that. But, um, but I can give you an example. Um, so right now, um, many of you, um, especially those folks over there, know it's football season right now. They're giving me a hard time because UT got creamed. Anyway, okay, so, um, but we're really trying to encourage people to take the regular fixed route to the football games, right? Because when the University of Tennessee is in session, the stadium is like, what, the fifth largest city in Tennessee, just the stadium. It's like a hundred and some odd thousand. It's ridiculous. So you can imagine what traffic's like. So we're trying to encourage people to take transit to that. And so we identified like five routes. Oh, these will be perfect. They run late at night. They run fairly frequently. Let's make it just like easy as pie. So we created the passenger playbooks. Really cool. So it li literally tells you step by step. Here are the little dots, almost like a subway map. You know, people love the subway map. Here are the dots where this goes by. Here's where you catch it. Here's how you pay on a little one page sheet that you can download. So it's super easy, color coded. So if you have to switch buses, Go to where the purple sign is, because you've got the purple flyer, you know, blah, 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 blah. So anyway, yay, big success. Um, and so I've been checking ridership numbers on that. And, um, and I'm also checking the um, comments that we get that come through. And so we had, on Saturday, on the busiest route, a bus breakdown. Two people got in a fight on another bus on the same route. So guess what? The bus was delayed. All of these people I was begging to take the bus are emailing me going, I was there for 30 minutes and no bus went in either direction. You know, wh who has experienced this as marketing people, right? It's so frustrating. Um, so you can't win all of them. Um, but 
having said that, you can't give up either. You've got to keep trying and you've got to work with your operations to emphasize that we're pouring our hearts and souls into this and do what you have to do. Stick an extra bus out there. Do whatever you can do. So, I mean, I think there's always going to be um, frustrations like that or, um, you know, trying to keep our frontline people happy um, is always a challenge too and friendly. And, um, but if you can do that, then you've sold the transit system. <clears throat> anyway. Great. Thanks, Melinda. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe I'll, I'll shift over to Leslie, something I wanted to ask you. So Atlanta is a, of course, highly uh, reliant on each other region amongst the different counties. And, and sometimes those conversations go smoothly. Sometimes there are obvious disagreements. At the ARC, kind of what have you, what strategies have you had to try or tactics have you had to use to kind of tell that story on a regional level? Uh, about the value of transit. Oh man, I should ask our Georgia Commute Options Manager. I'm sure he has some more stories, but um, in general, it's a lot of convening, a lot of hashing out uh, any disagreements, being honest about it, and, and at the end of the day, we all have the same goal, so so we get there. Um, we host a lot of um, summits now, a TDM summit. We just had a Connect ATL summit so that we can learn from one another about messaging and, and just thinking it, planning into the future. Um, I just say just it, it's always a messy process. Any mm -hmm. worth, anything worth succeeding at is going to be have a, have a lot of hurdles. So um, having a platform for open communication, ARC is definitely the convener in the region. Um, not that we're the only ones. MARTA definitely does a good job of bringing some of our operators together to have more technical conversations. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, that's a great start. It's probably the most honest <laughs> And I think that, no, that's good to have the, you hear that honesty too. I think that's just as equally important. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, Kelvin, I'll go with you. So as the general manager, you probably have to deal with audiences that are at the executive level of stakeholders across the region. You probably have writers that come up to you and say, oh, you're the general manager. Let me tell you what I think. <laughs> uh, so how do you shift your persona or shift your message depending on who you're talking to and, and what you're trying to get across? Uh, well, the first thing is, is that you have to be, <clears throat> as a general manager, you have, in my opinion, you have to be approachable. If the folks who use your service see you as a general manager and they don't think that they can come and talk to you about the problems that they have with the system, then you have a communication problem with those folks. A lot of times in some agencies you have the general manager will always direct them to the communications department, the customer service department. Um, if you have a problem, call 911 or whatever, instead of just sitting down listening to the folks and talking to the folks about some of the issues that they have. The other aspect is you have elected officials. Uh, elected officials hear from their constituents about the good and bad about public transit. Uh, a lot of times, you in Montgomery and probably everywhere else, you have talk radio. And on talk radio, no one ever talks about the positive things about public transit. It's always about the negative things about public transit. It's always about, I see this bus going down the street, there's only one person on the bus, and then the elected officials come to us and say, why is there only one person on the bus? Uh, the first thing I ask is, well, what time of day was it? Uh, it was 8.30 at night. Well, our service closes at 9.30, so how many people are actually going to be on the bus at 8.30 at night? I said, come out and look at 5.30 in the morning when folks are going to work, or going to school, or whatever, and you'll see a lot more folks on the bus. Uh, we try to tailor our message to those individuals that, or those groups that we're talking to. Uh, I said we, we did Leadership Montgomery. Uh, that's a bunch of community leaders who are uh, CEOs, uh, things of, of different organizations. And they want to know, why do, we, why do we want to use public transit? Part of the problem in Montgomery, I say it's a problem, the problem for a transit official is, we don't have traffic congestion. Atlanta has traffic congestion. Montgomery, their traffic congestion is 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes <laughs> in the afternoon. That's it. You can get from one part of Montgomery in, in a car in 10 minutes. Unfortunately, when folks look at us, they say, well, I want to get from the west side of Montgomery to the east side of Montgomery in 10 minutes. It cannot be done. But let me tell you what we can do for you, that you get on the bus and it may take you 30 minutes to, to, to complete that trip, 
but you don't have to deal with gas. You don't have to deal with uh, road rage. You don't have to deal with um, just the fact of, and parking is not an issue in Montgomery either, but, um, but it could be parking. So you get on the bus, uh, it takes you 30 minutes to get to your location, uh, and you're there. One of the issues also is that we have to deal with uh, what happens if I have an emergency that I have to get out and I don't have the bus there. We don't have that uh, call and get a ride type of thing, but we, we have to emphasize the folks that you're saving overall in a, in a year's time versus the one single time that you may have a problem with your, your service. We try to, and I try to as a GM, just talk to folks about the benefits of public transit, why you want to use the transit, the environmental aspects of public transit, uh, also about, like with elected officials, about the economic development that we actually bring to um, the, the city of Montgomery. A lot of times folks say, well, well transit is, is, doesn't do anything for the community. Well, and, and I'm sure one of the slides, one of the pre presenters earlier talked about all the different organizations that have put their businesses on the motor line. Well, transit can bring some of those issues uh, to bear in Montgomery too. We just have to convince those people of that. Mm -hmm. And something I would like to say kind of as a follow-up to that, I think it's very true, transportation, the way you sell it can uh, really needs to resonate with a different audience. Uh, in my previous life, I was a consultant trying to convince people bike lanes were a good thing. And in some places, it was all about environmentalism. We want to get people on bikes. We wanted to reduce emissions. And that would play well in some, in some stages. Whereas in other places, it was nothing about that at all. It was all about giving people freedom, giving them the option to ride the bike if they want to ride their bike and not get killed at the same time. So I think it's very much <laughs> hearing uh, the same thing that you were just saying there. I want to Kelly. add on also, um, the Regional Commission, we, depending on what boundary we're working on, what, what task we're working on, it can be up to 22 counties. And that's a cross section of Atlanta to very rural areas. Um, and we're starting to hear, um, not because of anything we've done, I don't think it's just the market, the people, um, more of the counties that used to say no to transit because we, we don't need it or we don't want it for whatever reason, um, are starting to come along. And maybe some of that some, to some of the strategic stuff we've done, but some of it is just because we're growing. Um, more people are moving to urban areas, whether they're, it's the major urban area in, the, in your state or, or the pockets of, of um, activity centers. Um, and um, they're starting to realize you can't build lanes wide enough to carry more cars. In the Atlanta region, we're gonna, um, let's see, Atlanta was founded in 1876 as a city. It took us since then to now to get to 5.5 million people. Um, in the next 23 years, we'll get to, to double that to 8 million people. Um, so we project, so it's just a ton of people coming at a higher pace and it's not all gonna be in Atlanta, it's gonna be in other urban centers. So um, the, the currently calm roads are gonna see that congestion that needs other mobility options. So um, I know we, uh, we do a lot of long range long-range planning. I don't know if that helps for your messaging today, but that could be a glimmer of hope that um, we need to continue pushing these, these core messages. Great. Thanks, Leslie. So a, co a question, maybe I'll start with Belinda, and then I'll go to the others as well. I, some of the messaging we've talked about today is about communicating to the general public, changing the perception of transit, which might be a more broad audience, which I think is really important. But I, just to take the, the top-down approach, it's also very much in your seats, probably working with board members, working with executive decision makers within your organization. And I'd like to start actually to ask any specific tactics you have tried uh, in Knoxville to kind of work with that audience and kind of change perceptions at mm -hmm. that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so um, I'll give the example we talked about the other day. Um, we completely redid our transit system in 2010 when we opened a new transit center. Um, thanks, Glenn. And so part of that was we had to change all the routes because they were coming into a totally different location. And we said, you know what, let's take the time to do this right. Um, right now, we've got routes that don't have enough time in them. Drivers are not happy. We need more layovers. Let's really just do this right. Um, so when you go to a board and you say, um, yeah, we need to um, add a bus to this route, but we're not going to increase the frequency at all. It's just we've got to, you know, room to grow. 
they're like, what are you up to? What are you, what, are you padding the book? You know, I mean, just, there's just this level of not understanding. Um, so what we did, um, of course, we were, we, we were going to transform the whole system all the way down to the transit center. So we called it catamorphosis, cat Knox area transit, catamorphosis. We were completely redoing the entire system. So what we did was instead of us going to the board and saying, uh, this is all we're doing, we pulled in a committee of the board at the very beginning and said, we're going to go through this process. We want you to go through this process with us. You are the, com the catamorphosis committee. And um, so we would meet, I don't know, like once a month, and we would show them the progress. Here's where we are with this. Here's where we are with this. Here's why we're doing this. Here's the public meeting we attend that you attended or that we had. Here are all the comments that we got, and here's how we can respond to them. Yes, we can do this. No, we can't because, and they literally saw everything. And so when this ended up going to the board, it was not CAT that presented it to the board for approval. It was the committee of the board. So the chair of that committee said, yeah, we think we need to approve this. And board members tend to trust other board members than trusting staff members. I don't know why, because we're totally cool. But anyway, it passed in seconds. Um, so pulling some of those folks in at the very beginning um, it's kind of like the whole honesty thing. You know, explain your process um, and people will understand that you're not just, you know, whatever they think you're doing. Um, and so that's been a really successful thing with us and we kind of try to do that with sort of higher level folks is, is bring them in early on or at least bring some of them in, um, win them over and let them tell the message instead of us telling the message. It's a great story. Kelvin, Leslie, did you, any of you guys want to chime in? Well, <clears throat> I don't have a board that we have to, I don't, we only have one person, and that's the mayor. And all we did was, when we did our route changes, we just talked to the mayor and showed him some of the complaints that we were getting from the public. Buses are always running late. It takes too long to get from point A to point B. Uh, we use methods, I don't want to put in a plug for Remix, but it was the first <laughs> time we used Remix we actually use Remix to show him the old routes and the new routes and how long uh, the routes were and how much better the, the system would be under the, under the current uh, proposed changes. And we sold him on, on doing those changes and why we would cut down on buses running late and why we would cut down on the, the length of time that you had, you had to be on the bus to make a trip. He was the only person that we had to convince. But we also did it with uh, some of the city council folks. We actually invited them in doing our transit development plan program to talk about the proposed changes that we were going to do to get their input about what they were hearing from their constituents about what changes they wanted in the transit system. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we have our um, regional transit committee at ARC that, that um, where we present to them on a monthly basis um, all the goings on in our office and, and not that we try to skew or lie, but, but, um, or that we should, but we will highlight some of the good feedback we're, we're getting, um, kind of to put it at the forefront of all the bad stuff they might be hearing across <laughs> different news outlets. Um, also, the, the summits are really awesome to invite them to, because they'll hear firsthand um, any success stories, and that rings louder than us telling them, mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. um, so just inviting them to, to different events Great. Is, is helpful. Cool, thanks. And so I think I'm going to ask, I'll ask one more question. Maybe this, I have one for Leslie, and then we want to make sure we leave time to open it up to the audience. So we'll go around, and if there are questions, please be thinking of them. We'll pass the mic around in a second. But I, I want to ask Leslie, since you are in a unique role as kind of a person that's at the forefront of technology and transit, and the way you think about convincing people of, of different things through data and, to, and the work that you do, um, what are some of the things you'd want to share with the audience in terms of how you have kind of come at your role and how your technology does apply to Sure, yeah, so, value. so my role has kind of morphed into this, uh, we do a lot of long range planning at ARC, so figuring out um, how do, can we be good stewards of our, of our dollars and strategies now, and what do we need to do to prepare for, for the technology changes in the future, whether it's you know, wayfinding improvements in transit systems or autonomous vehicles helping with last mile connectivity, um, bike share deployments um, becoming more ubiquitous. Um, 
we did a policy document to help us frame everything, um, which is online. You're welcome to read it. It's pretty fun and nerdy. Um, <laughs> we, we, we realized that we don't have all the answers. Um, we just don't. A lot of it's because all of the companies at the forefront, the, the owners of the technology, um, are competing, so, so we can't get it all out of them. So we invited a lot of them <laughs> into the room to speak with our local government officials, our transit operators, to um, see what they can get out of it. Um, and a, another big part is um, looking at, strategically, what's the low-hanging fruit to help um, everyone in the region. Like I mentioned, we have super urban centers like Atlanta, and then we have more rural or, and everything in between communities. Um, anyone that runs any sort of transit up to the same level playing field of decision making. So um, for that, I'll plug Remix. Remix has been huge in that. We've, we've had open source products that we've used before. Some people use spreadsheets or pen and paper. Um, and getting everyone to, make, to talk the same language is, is key. Um, so we're, we're looking at, um, I think you know Karen, looking at a regional license for, for Remix so that we can all access it easier. Um, so that we can, again, speak the same language internally for more technical stuff and then publicly for decision makers and, and, the, and the public. Thanks. I would add that in Montgomery, one of the things that uh, our staff is an older staff. They've been there probably as long as I've been alive. And they had the old way of doing things. Uh, you, you'd have folks call on the, call on the, on the phone and say, where's the bus? And the, the dispatcher would get on the radio, call the driver, say, where are you? Get back on the phone, tell the person where the bus <laughs> is. So in the last couple of years, we actually did a, a real-time um, bus information. So the, the dispatcher now can look on the, on the screen and tell exactly where the bus is. Uh, the, the passengers or customers can actually get on their phone, their smartphones. They can see where the bus is. So that has cut down on a lot of uh, the phone calls about where the bus is. Also about the complaints about the bus. I don't know where the bus is. The bus, I can never tell when the bus is going to be there. So I think technology, even for a small transit system, is playing a big part in, in trying to help uh, increase ridership and make it more useful for, uh, as folks talk about millennials. Millennials are looking for the, the easiest and the, and the best way to use technology to do things. And we think that bringing those things on how you plan your trip, and also uh, the real-time bus information goes a long way in trying to promote your transit system. Great, thanks. So I think we have about maybe 10 minutes, a little north of 10 minutes for q and I'd love this to be an opportunity for just questions. If you have comments you want to chime in, maybe with your stories about how you've done this, we'd love to hear that. So I think Lance is going to get us started from, from St. Yeah. Louis. I guess the question comes down to, and it's Kevin and, and Belinda both is, <laughs> We want to please our commissioners and the mayor, and we want to, you know, please you know our passengers and get information. So, how did you use? Have you used the tool, or anybody else in the room used the remix tool to show our customers? But the most important part, and I think we forget about all the time, because I was a driver for 25 years, and so we know where we come from and what it is, but we forget about the driver. And uh, you were talking, Belinda, about you're getting feedback. And did you use that to go back to the drivers and say, here's what we're doing for you? And how did, that re how did they react? Mm -hmm. Because I know the reaction I'm getting right now is, when I talk to them is, I'll show you how to redo your job. Right. And they don't know what the costs are. So how did the Remax you know, get you to get to that point to where you can show them the costs and everything? Right. So one thing I did neglect to mention when I was talking about catamorphosis and bringing in those board members through the whole process, we also had bus, two bus operators and a road supervisor who represented um, our bus operators through that entire process from step one on. So we, we said, hey, we're thinking about this route, and they, they would the representatives from um, the bus operators was, were very involved and actually were key in, in some decisions that we made. Um, so bringing them in through a process um, was enormously helpful. Um, so as far as Remix goes, um, I, we're relatively new to Remix. I don't even know if we've had it for a year, but everybody in Knoxville is so freaking sick of me talking about how much I love Remix because it's transformed the way that I can convey information. So for example, um, somebody called me, uh, 
well, somebody called the mayor's office and said, we need transit service here to my place, you know, whatever. We, we all know that story. So I, I'm able to, you know, kind of hop on Remix and draw the route and go, okay, well, it's going to cost you the way you want to run it, 400 and some odd thousand dollars, and this is one of the lowest density populations in the area. So you decide, you know. So it's, it's been a really helpful tool um, to explain things to mayors, but also to explain things to the general public who doesn't understand why you can't just extend the route. It's only a half a mile, you know, and you, you just run up there, run, you know, so that is where it's been really helpful is with, you know, all of the public saying, well, why don't you just come down to my business, which is a great problem to have as opposed to I want you out of the way of my business, you know, so it's great, but it's, it's been that instant information that's been really useful to us. I was that customer when I bought my place <laughs> years ago. Um, so we bought our place, it was on the bus, the three bus, and then the three bus got chopped to two yeah. blocks further, two long blocks. And then I thought about it, I was like, oh, that's a big, there's more congestion here, less congestion there, it'll be more efficient if it runs on that route versus cutting through the neighborhood. It's so frustrating because I want to, I always want to reward people who make a decision based to where they live based on transit because most of the time, I moved to this apartment complex and now I need you to bring the bus to me. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? I get that. I can't tell you how much I get that. But so, I, that's why I try not to change the route as, as much as I can because I want to reward people who make those decisions. What we, what we did was, <clears throat> when we did our route changes, the, the first thing we did was, the old way of doing things is to have the cardboard cutouts of all the different routes of each route we had. <laughs> um, and you ask how Remix helped us. We actually, uh, part of the whole thing about selling to Remix was they actually let us use the product. Um, and we actually brought in all the, the drivers into our meetings. And we could actually put each individual route up on a screen and they could make suggestions on changes to the routes. And we could show the changes and tell them why we could or could not do that. Um, and once we did that, we took the driver's input on those schedules, put it in the remix, came up with a different type of route structure, took it to the public. With the public, we would do the same thing. We'd have the cardboard cutouts, uh, and they couldn't see what effect that the changes that they were proposing would have on the service. So we could actually draw the changes show them how we could do that or we couldn't do that. Uh, we talk about um, the length of time people had to be on the bus. And you know, someone will make a suggestion that we need to go to this place. Or we can say, well, you turn a 30 minute route into a 45 minute route. And say, well, we don't want to do that. We also put, um, on the, we put the Remix proposed schedules on, the, on our website. And they could go in to Remix, into the thing, make comments about the changes, whether they liked the changes or didn't like the changes. And I, I think they also could just draw on some different things on the website. So we use Remix in our public meetings, in our driver's meetings, and on our website for our changes. I'd maybe echo what, what you both have actually said, is that I think a lot of people think about Remix as a service planning tool, but I do think a lot of our customers come back and say, actually, it's, more of a, it's, it's a way for me to communicate okay. more broadly and get people on the same page. Mm -hmm. okay. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you want to come from helping? <laughs> Where are you? St. Louis. Sure, I've never been there. <laughs> White Tangent, Birmingham. Okay, well, well um, we're from Birmingham, and some of the things I wanted to speak to Leslie about from Atlanta, how did you all prepare for uh, the Olympics? When you talk about you know expansion, you got all these people that are coming from all over. Um, as yeah. you know that Birmingham will be hosting the World Games in 2021. And being that right now we only have a fixed route service and we're, um, we're right now in the uh, development stages of a BRT. So I would just like to hear just some of the, you know, the techniques. How did y'all basically prepare for something like that? Um, I'll have to get you in contact with someone who was, <laughs> I was in New York in sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, but from my studies, <laughs> um, I know there's the Harvard Business School teaches the Columbus Way, this uh, 
business and government partnership to make things happen quickly without any, any resistance. Um, there was the Atlanta way, the, the business and local community and the federal community came together to make sure that um, there were more buses, there was greater investment in transit and the buses were cleaner. We had a cons uh, poor air quality at the time, so all of our buses were CNG or at that point. Um, I don't know if they did incentives for transit and promotion um, through the business, the tourism community. I would expect they, they got the word out about using MARTA from the airport. That connection to the boarding, uh, the baggage claim is huge. Um, getting straight from the airport to downtown Atlanta to your hotels. Um, some events were spread out throughout the region, but um, I think those were the biggest things. Is just you know, having a unified vision and everyone working quickly together and communicating effectively. But I can definitely get you in contact with someone who was working <laughs> at the time. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Other questions? We have one, Steve over here in the back. Uh, thanks, uh, question, and, and a little off topic, but, but I think it does um, pertain to building markets and the value of transit. Uh, Leslie, I was riding uh, the metro yesterday and noticed uh, um, a group of um, junior high kids, uh, school kids riding, you know, and, and they were in uniforms. And Woodward Academy. Uh, obviously, <laughs> this is the market if we can introduce them to transit, um, you know, and, and, and they understand, you know, they get comfortable with it. To what extent do you have uh, junior high kids and, and, and others on the panel there using your system? Have you reached out to the school districts? Um, uh, yeah, is, or did I see perhaps just a, a small example? Of no, um, what you saw is a pretty interesting example. Um, Woodward Academy is our most prestigious uh, public, uh, private school, sorry. Um, it's in College Park, southwest of Atlanta. And people go to that school from all over the region. It's, it's a very expensive school. I had friends who went there um, and um, yeah, they take transit. I think the school sells it themselves just to make it accessible. Because to get someone from an um, uh, affluent neighborhood like Buckhead to drive their, their child down to south of the city and then get back to work, probably north of the city if I had to guess, um, it's just not manageable. So at some point you, you train your child to take transit and it's widely popular and I know Atlanta has race issues and, and different perceptions about transit and for some reason it doesn't affect our school children that go to the most prestigious private school in the region. Um, but there are um, a lot more in-town students who also take transit. Um, my boss, two levels up, his daughter takes the bus to school and to any other activities and he feels bad sometimes, but it, it's a great lesson for her. Um, we have um, some Safe Routes to Schools programs, definitely a lot of those, and I'm sure MARTA has some programs that they've, they work hard, hard on, I think Safe Routes to School as well. Um, and then there's different you know, pricing for students, which probably helps. So, yeah. I have a follow-up question to that. So I think one of the challenges that I've been seeing is that related to school kids is that transit is often seen as something that's dangerous for a kid to be by themselves. And I know maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago, it was fine for a kid to walk to school on their own or with a group. So how are you guys overcoming that obstacle or that perception that riding transit is dangerous for a child? This, less, less the cell phone. It's like you can contact, if you see something, you can say something, you can contact the police. I, I at least. With, I have a sister who's 13, and uh, we're fine with her as long as she has her cell phone on her and it's charged and you know, she doesn't use it for bad things. <laughs> so, uh, that's one personal answer. We, we, uh, <clears throat> it, it, it's probably a, a, a good and bad with, with school kids in Montgomery. Uh, about six years ago, we had a, a large number of school kids who use our transit services to get back and forth to school. Um, one of the things that Montgomery had was, um, and I forget the, the technical name, but we had a lot of school kids going out of their district, out of their zone, across town to, to the other schools. And so the only way they could get there was through public transit. So we, had, we actually had to put extra buses out just for school kids. The downside of that is sometimes school kids act up on the bus and the, uh, older adults don't want to ride the bus <laughs> with the school kids. Um, and so we had to say, and I 
I hate to use that word. We had to move the school kids away from the, 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 uh, the older population of, kid, of, of adults uh, and have their own separate bus. And unfortunately, from, from our perspective, the school board changed their zoning issues and, and what school bus, what people could use for the school bus. And so school kids were able to use school buses more than transit buses. So we actually lost a little bit of our school ridership. Mm -hmm. It's a good t a storytelling probably opportunity there too. With if if students aren't taking transit or a bus to school, they're probably being driven, and cars are terribly unsafe. Um, <laughs> there what forty thousand deaths on our roads last year, highest killer in people under the age of thirty. The um, autonomous vehicle coalitions and alliances that keep popping up, they're touting safety like crazy, and, and transit is definitely a safe option for them. So that might be a storytelling opportunity for, for and our communities. And certainly if you've talked to any school themselves, the congestion around schools sure. mm -hmm. is one thing that they are trying to figure out how to Those alleviate. Those YouTube videos are just, they, they stress me out of parents <laughs> waiting 45 minutes yeah. to get in and out of this terrible yeah. car maze. Like, the, just the air quality must be, certainly. anyway. Oh, yeah. back, back to his question, if you're trying to encourage school kids to use a transit system, and you, you, you want to market it to the school kids, uh, also take into effect the effect that it's going to have on your on the others, and market to those folks too. Okay. He has another question. Right. And, and that's a good point, and, and um, it's an excellent point because um, there is that issue you have to deal with. If and, and I think it gets to uh, estimating your demand on a particular route, because if if it's all junior high kids. <laughs> it's going to be disruptive to regular passengers, but but I, I think there is a market there that is an industry we need to pursue, and, and and you do have some you know issues that you have to address, such as yesterday, um, they they had a little game going where the door would open and they'd run out and see if they could touch the wall, get back in before the door closed, <laughs> but um, nevertheless it's good and they did have uniforms on so I suspect that they were coming from a private school they're going to a private school but um, <laughs> to the extent we can get that demographic comfortable with transit and thinking transit has value I, so much the better great. so unfortunately we are out of time there's a lot of great discussion here going on I suspect that you'll see these three throughout the day so if you have follow-up questions you'll have the opportunity to ask them but I do want to thank our panelists Linda Kelvin <laughs> Leslie for your great thoughts.